So let's start the second talk. The, 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 the second speaker is Professor Michael Kem Kemeny of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The title is Universal Second, second Bundles and the CCGs. So please. Okay. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to be talking about syzygies of curves, in particular uh, canonical curves. So I'll, I'll start with some, some background. So the classical approach to studying projective varieties, maybe the very first approach uh, in the, the very old days of algebraic geometry, Uh, was to just embed them in projective space and then study the equations um, that define the varieties. And this lets you kind of study projective varieties algebraically. And it was um, somehow the, the original way of studying, of doing algebraic geometry in, uh, in the days of Hilbert and in the late 19th century before they kind of had um, the advanced machinery that we have nowadays. Okay, so one case, uh, so one example rather, where this approach um, has been studied a lot is the case of a canonically embedded curve. So one example where this approach has been quite fruitful is the case of a canonically embedded curve. And this is the case I'm going to talk about. Okay, so we have a smooth curve of genus G, we look at the canonical line bundle, which is just, uh, in this case, the dual of the tangent bundle. And then we can embed the curve in a canonical way in projective space through the canonical bundle. And this is an embedding so long as the curve is not hyperelliptic. Okay. So this we all know from Hartshorn that um, as long as there is no two to one cover of the curve by P1, then um, this is an embedding. So then kind of a very elementary question that was asked in the 19th century, I guess, was uh, so what can we say about the dimension of the space of hypersurfaces containing the curve? Dimension. So, what is the dimension of the space of hypersurfaces of degree n containing the curve in PG minus one? And then the answer, of course. Um, uh, comes to us from Max Noether's theorem. All 
from 1890, which I think is kind of the first relevant um, theorem on this topic. It tells us that if C is not hyperelliptic, then the pullback under uh, the canonical morphism of H naught O N is subjective onto um, H naught omega C to the N. Okay, and in modern language, we say that uh, this means that uh, the service works for all in. And in modern language, we say that C is projectively normal. Okay, so in particular, this answers the elementary question. because um, the space of hypersurfaces of degree n containing the curve is just the kernel of the map I wrote down, um, and we can compute the dimensions. So this answers the previous question as the space of hypersurfaces of degree n containing The curve is um, precisely the kernel of this morphism, or this map of vector spaces, right? Um, and so, it, hence, it has to mention equal to um, dimension of PG minus one N minus the dimension of omega C to the N. And this we know by Riemann Rock. Right, so this dimension we know by Riemann Rock. And this, well, this is the dimension. So this space is the same, we know from Hartshorn as sim n of H naught O one, and it has dimension G plus N minus one, choose N. So we know the dimension of the space of hypersurfaces of degree n as a direct corollary of max monotonicity. Um, but another reason to be interested in Max Nernest's theorem is it lets us study the problem purely algebraically. So Max Nernest's theorem lets us study the curve. through purely algebraic means. So um, consider, so to set up the problem in a purely algebraic manner, consider the polynomial ring sim of O1, so sim of O1 is the same as sim of H0 omega C, and this is, uh, if you choose a basis, this is a polynomial ring in G variables, and we think of this as a graded ring. And now, um, by Max Nernst's theorem, I know what the homogeneous coordinate ring of C is. It's the following ring. So 
So it's just a it's just a ring of sections of powers of the canonical bundle. This is a homogeneous coordinate ring of C. And uh, Max Nervous theorem in algebraic language is just the same as saying that you have a natural map from S to um, gamma omega C, which is um, which we think of as a graded S module. So we have a natural subjective morphism of graded S modules and then the paces of this. The graded pieces of this are just so the graded pieces of S are sim n, H not omega C. And this subjects onto H not omega C to the end by maximum still. Because I can write this. Um, so. Okay, and this map here is of course is just a natural multiplication. Okay, so um, now let's consider the homogeneous ideal of C, which is defined to be the kernel of this morphism F. Then um, IC is a homogeneous ideal And the nth graded piece is the space of hypersurfaces of degree n containing the curve. Okay, so this is kind of um, the object that we're going to study. So the ideal um, of the curve is a very interesting S module. Um, so here's a kind of a few kind of questions you can ask about it. So the first question you might want to ask about this um, homogeneous ideal is what are the degrees of some generators of this um, when thought of as an S module? So the first question that I think everyone's probably seeing is what are the degrees of the ideal of the curve as an S module? Uh, so what are the degrees of generators of IC? And then the answer comes from Petri's theorem from 1922, which tells us that um, other than some finite list of well understood exceptions, the ideal of the curve is always generated by elements of degree two. So let me not focus on the exceptions, but say um, with a finite list of well understood exceptions, if we exclude the exceptions, that we understand, then this module is generated by elements of degree two. So 
in other words, is generated by quadrics Q um, of by quadrics in PG minus one vanishing on the curve. So let me just mention one other question. Um, if we know that we can find a set of generators for the ideal of the curve um, given by quadrics, then well, we have a notion of rank of a quadric. So a natural question that comes up is what's uh, the minimal ranks of quadrics of the quadrics which generate The ideal of the curve. Um, and then the answer to this was um, only given in complete generality in 1984. So this is a question that was asked by Andriotti and Meyer in 67. And then uh, Green gave the complete solution in 1984. And green solution, green's paper, I think is pretty detailed. It's kind of, it's pretty technically involved. And the theorem is that um, it's always generated by quadrics of rank four. Okay, and uh, just as an aside, um, Green used this to give um, an explicit version of the Torelli theorem. So an explicit way to reconstruct a curve from its um, Jacobian. Okay, so these are some natural questions which um, have been studied a lot, um, but then you might want to go beyond. So this just tells you something about the generators of the ideal that doesn't tell you much more about the structure of the ideal. So um, if you want to say something more substantial about the structure of this S module, um, then you need to introduce a new tool. So in order to say something more substantial. About the S module. Think of this object as a graded S module. I see. We need to um, introduce a tool from community algebra. So fortunately for us, commutative algebraists have um, a whole raft of techniques for studying modules. And one of the most important things that they do to get invariants associated to a graded module is they take the minimal free resolution. This is a standard algebraic method to obtain 
invariance of an S module So what you do is you form the minimal free resolution. So let's look at the minimal free resolution of the homogeneous coordinate ring of the curve. So then um, it starts off like this, and then we take um, some generators of the ideal and this gives us a free module. Um, so the generators of the ideal give us a free module F1. Then we look at the kernel, which is the relations. We take generators of the relations and so on. Yeah, so this map here, so these are all free. Fi are free, graded S modules. And, um, the image of this, uh, these gives you the generators of the ideal. And then F2 gives you the generators of the relations and so on. So these modules are free graded S modules, which means that they can be written as um, direct sums of twist of the polynomial ring. So let's write them like this. Let's write Fi as some sum over J of twists by minus I minus J, Bij. So these betting numbers, Bij, record the number of copies of each twist. Um, and they give you fundamental algebraic invariance of a graded module. So it's a way of getting some invariance out of a graded module in an algebraic manner. And we call this whole space, the number of the space consisting of copies of S minus I minus J as um, the syzygy space K I J C on C. Okay, so you, you can do all this for any polarized variety, just replacing omega C with any um, globally generated line bundle on any variety. But I've just done it for concreteness in this case. And, um, and this produces some invariance um, algebraically out of a polarized variety. Okay, so these Betty numbers are fundamental algebraic invariants. For example, follows immediately from the definitions that B11 is let's say B11C omega C. Let me put, because I'll need to be able to change it. Let's put the C omega C's there. Then B11 is by definition, you can see it's the uh, dimension of the space of quadrics containing the curve. Okay. So then Green's question is basically, what are the Betty numbers for a canonical curve? Very loosely. So question, uh, Green asked this in 1984. Assume that C is a general canonical curve Let's focus on the case of general curves in this talk. And what are the Betty numbers? Okay. 
So we can put the Betty numbers together into a table called the Betty table, which has IJ entry. EJI. And then uh, very precisely, Green made the following conjecture. So the problem naturally splits into the case of even genus and odd genus, with the answer looking different for both. And his conjecture tells you that a general curve of even genus G equals 2K has a Betty table with the following shape. One. So I'm just going to write the, the non-zero entries. So he predicts the following um, zeros in the Betty table. So, this, so on the first row, we have non-zero entries B11 up to BK minus 1, 1, and then it's 0. And on the second row, it's 0 up until BK minus 1. We have BK minus one, two, and then it's non-zero up until the two K minus three, two. Okay, so this is the shape for uh, for even genus, and then for odd genus. The shape is similar, but uh, there's a little bit of a shift. So now this entry is zero. And the um, next entry is not zero. B, K2. Okay, so these are the shapes that he conjectures for the Betty tables. Okay. And um, some facts are that this is a very strong conjecture. So some facts are that we always know um, for projective varieties, uh, in terms of the Hilbert polynomial, you can compute the alternating sum of entries along these off diagonals. So notice that Green is conjecturing exactly in both cases, one non-zero entry on each of the off diagonals. And since we always know um, the alternating sum of the entries by some Hilbert polynomial argument due to Hilbert, then um, an elementary fact is that if the conjecture is true, we know all the Betty numbers, and so we um, know the shape of the entire free resolution. So elementary facts. And the first fact is due to Hilbert. So due to a fact of Hilbert, the conjecture implies that uh, we can calculate all the Betty numbers um, and another fact is that it's enough to it's enough to show that we have these and these first zeros on the top row. Um, and then once you have this, then it's, it's well known that this implies BP1 equals zero for all P. And then you also get the vanishing on the 
in the second row by some um, symmetry that's always there in the Betty tables. So it's enough to show these single vanishings big K1. So, um, so if we can show this BK1 equals zero, then we understand completely um, all of the terms in the minimal free resolution. Okay. Okay, and one other elementary fact. So um, this, the, the first facts, the first two facts are very old, they're due to Hilbert basically, that the next fact is a bit, is in the, is, um, is an observation um, coming from Lazarsfeld in the 80s. Um, I think it's actually older than the conjecture, but let's say Lazarsfeld in the 80s. We can um, reformulate this geometrically in terms of the cohomology of some natural vector bundle. Can reformulate the conjecture in a way that to me as an algebraic geometer is more appealing. Because it's in terms of the vanishing. Of cohomology of vector bundles. So we define um, the bundle M omega C by the following as the kernel of the evaluation map from the sections of the canonical bundle. Um, and then um, you see quite readily from the causal complex that the PQ Betty number is the same thing as the dimension of the kernel of some natural map we have like this. One, I'm gonna say minus one. Okay. Okay. So um, this is the situation. Um, notice, right? Unfortunately, for Q equals one, H one of omega c to the Q minus one is H one O c. It's not zero. But in any case, one can always write the the Benny numbers as uh, the kernel of some some map. Some natural map that we have between cohomology of some vector bundles. So we can describe it um, algebra geometric. Okay, so this is Green's conjecture. Um, Poisson famously proved it in two papers in 2002 and 2005. But um, these papers are both 45 pages long, using a lot of the geometry of the Hilbert schemes on K3 surfaces. And the community has found them pretty difficult to read. So Vazan proved this, um, proved these conjectures, this conjecture in two papers. So she proved it first for even genus, and then she came up with an argument showing how to deduce odd genus out of even genus. Um, but the papers, they're both very long and they're very hard for people to read. So they use very deep geometry. Um, of the Hilbert scheme. And I think people didn't really understand the papers and sort of were kind of intimidated to even try to read them. It's like I, I spoke to, to Claire and she kind of uh, was a bit, I think she seems a bit annoyed that no one really tried to, to understand the papers. Okay. So I want to talk about a simpler approach that is still, it's much simpler. So uh, for example, 
Uh, in the first, for the even genus case, you can get a proof in, in just three pages. But despite its simplicity, it's still kind of, it's really a simplification of Lausanne's argument. So it, it does use, it, it doesn't use Hilbert schemes and it doesn't use a lot of the dimension county arguments, but there's, there's still the, the kind of, it's definitely inspired by, by her approach. So let me give you a simpler approach. And I'm just going to talk about the even genus case, maybe say a few words about odd genus. Okay. Okay, so the starting point is, is the same as Bozan. So you let X be a K3 surface. So a K3 surface has, uh, by definition, H1 O X equals zero. And the canonical bundle is trivial. And um, if you pick a general K3 surface of um, genus G, then the Picard group of X is generated by a line bundle Okay, so by the junction formula, um, any curve in the linear system L gives you a canonical curve. And so maybe here's a diagram. So um, we take some hyperplane then we intersect it to get um, a canonical curve. And then our goal, uh, let's set um, G to be 2K. Then our goal is to prove BK minus one, one, C omega C equals zero for curve C in L. And then um, you can check that this is, that the betting numbers of the K3 surface are the same as the betting numbers of the curve. This is called the hyperplane restriction theorem. It's not so hard to check. Uh, B, sorry, I think I want to be K1. Hyperplane restriction theorem tells you BK1 XL is always the same as for any P, in fact, BK1 C omega C. And um, I can now go back to the definition that I gave you, but replace omega C with the line bundle L on the K3. And uh, now it's a bit nicer. So, um, this becomes L. I'm doing this for, so Q becomes one, so this goes away. This, let's say X wedge K plus one ML. And now this um, term here becomes H1, I just write that so um wedge k plus one h naught l tensor h one o x and that's now zero. So it's a little bit simpler for a K3 surface because we only need h one x wedge k plus one. ML to be zero, where ML is the kernel bundle defined like this on the K3 surface.
Okay, so that's an appealing reformulation, right? It's, it's just, uh, you have to prove the cohomology of some vector bundle is zero. Okay, but unfortunately, there seems to be no direct way um, to do this. Okay. So, um, one, needs to, one needs to introduce some special object. So, um, one needs some very special object. On the K3 surface called uh, the Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle. Um, so these bundles were first constructed by Mukai, and then Lazarsfeld used the same bundles to give a new proof of um, the Brill Noda Petri theorem that didn't involve degeneration. It was much more beautiful. So let me define the, the, the key Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle, which it also appears in Wazan's proof. So um, define the following rank two bundle um, A, whose dual. fits into the following sequence. So I pick some C in the linear system L, and I pick some line bundle um, A in W1, K plus one, C. So all the curves in the linear system L um, I'm known to have tonality K plus one, which means that the least degree is such that there is a map to P1 is K plus one. And then you look at the associated line bundles and from these you can construct a vector bundle. Um, so this means A line bundles of H not A equals two, three A equals K plus one. Then I get the, the famous Lazarus for the Mukai bundle, which is a bundle whose dual looks like this. Uh, so it's given by the evaluation map on the surface um, associated to the evaluation map from, from, from the vector space of sections of a line bundle with two sections of degree k plus one on the curve um, to that to the bundle. Okay, so the key fact is that E does not depend on the choice of C or A, um, and it is a unique, stable rank to bundle on the K3 surface with invariance H not E equals K plus two H um, I E zero for I positive. So recall that um, vector bundles on K3 surfaces, so stable vector bundles on K3 surfaces form very interesting moduli spaces. They're always hyper Kähler manifolds. In this case, um, you just have a point. So it's kind of a very special situation when you have a unique, you have a moduli space of dimension zero on a K3 surface. And it gives you a unique vector bundle and uh, probably it's a good idea to study those vector bundles. Okay, so the, the starting point for, for my approach is that um, I'm in Lazarsfeld Uh, they were studying the asymptotic syzygies of Veronese varieties, and then they came up with a method to construct syzygies out of special um, loci in a variety. So they have a method to construct syzygies out of special loci, and we can apply it to loci um, of the form, the zero set of sections of um, this vector bundle, the Lazarus-Mukai bundle of E. 
So it's a method to construct syzygies of the K3 out of secant loci of the form ZS, where S is the section of this um, Lazarus of Mukai bundle. Okay, so they were actually studying this in a, in a slightly different context, but um, if you do it here, you find something interesting. Okay, so let's um, take a section of this rent to Lazarus of Mukai bundle then um, by the causal complex, so the determinant of E is L. So we get a complex like this. And then the ein lazarsfeld approach says to look at the following diagram um, okay so let's just uh, let's look at some diagrams we get so h naught l by i c s by o x Um, goes to L by I T S goes to zero goes to H not L by O X goes to L goes to L Z S goes to zero. Let's let me call this alpha. And let me define W S to be co kernel of alpha. And you get a diagram like this. Um, where in the middle we have by definition this bundle ML, um, whose cohomology or cohomology of wedges of it controls the syzygies of the K3. And then we have um, these kernel bundles of these other guys. So let's call this first cone S prime. And let's call this second kernel bundle gamma S prime. Okay, so then we get the short exact sequence S S prime goes to ML goes to gamma S prime. These guys here are called the secant sheaves. Uh, they're defined by this sequence. It comes up naturally associated to S and they're defined by ein lazarsfeld And then the basic idea is that um, by considering this, one can relate syzygies to these sheaves S prime and gamma prime, which are somehow easier to get. So this is the ein lazarsfeld approach, um, but there are kind of two things which are not um, which are not great about it. So the first problem is that at least one of the secant sheaves, gamma s prime, is not locally free, and the second problem is um, that construction is unnatural because it depends upon a choice of a section.
Okay, so then my idea is simply, uh, so, is, so one can be easily resolved by taking a blow up, and then the idea is for, for two, just to generalize, um, just to instead of working with a fixed section, work over the space of all sections together and then prove cohomological vanishing depth. Okay, so let me try to describe this. So for one, um, this first problem is easy to fix, so we can easily get vector bundles. So take the blow up um, in this special locus CS. Now define, um, so say this has exceptional divisor DS, then we can identify WS with H naught BS and the pullback of L quotiented by H naught um, I, I DS. And then um, we have the same thing, but now with um, vector bundles. Where S is defined similarly, but um, so now the, the key thing is right, once you blow up, this ideal we had before is, um, is now becomes the ideal of a divisor, so it becomes a line bundle. So this means that if you repeat the, the analysis full construction, the sequence sheaves become bundles. So the first one is just, that then they're both natural kernel bundles, I, D, two prime star S, L by I, D, um, and then gamma S is the kernel of this map, W, S, I O B to pi star L D S. And what's nice is that now you get um, you get this short exact uh, this short exact sequence where everything are bundles. Okay, and the second problem is we want to remove dependence on the choice. So this is simple enough. We just um, relativize everything by working on x times p h naught e. So let uh, z now be the set of pairs. So let me call this space p. Now let me work with the space of pairs x, s on x times p such that s, x equals zero. So this is like a relative, it's just uh, for each section s, we look at the zero set. Then this lives inside x times p. Let, um, so we have projection maps x times p to x and q. To P. Let pi P to X times P denote the blow up in Z. If exceptional divisor D. Um, now we have just generalizing the previous uh, constructions in this relative setting. Um, we have, so if I let P prime be to X Q prime, B to P be the projections, then I can define a vector bundle S on B by the following formula. And um, 
Now, if I define, so I'm, I'm almost done. So if I define M to be the pullback under the blow up of ML box OP, then the, the observation is everything relativizes so that you get a short exact sequence like this. where these guys are vector bundles um, of rank K, which, um, which relativize the previous vector bundles. Okay, and now by Kunath, um, Green's conjecture is the same as showing that H1 of wedge K plus 1 of M is 0. Right? So to do this, this is the same as H1 wedge K plus 1. Um, so by kind of, it would be enough to show this. And now um, to do this, we want to just take. Um, the k plus one wedge of one, and um, since the first, since the vector bundle gamma has rank k, uh, if I take the k plus one wedge of gamma, it's zero. So this gives us an exact sequence like this. Space. Um, So now it's enough to show the following. Um, so it's to show that, to show this H1 of which K plus one of this curly M is zero, it's enough to show HI of um, wedge k plus one minus i by sim i s equals zero from this long exact sequence. Okay, but this is an easy exercise now. So, so this turns Green's conjecture, once you have the setup, into just an easy calculation anyone can do. So now it's just an easy, so this particular statement here is just an easy exercise. That's no harder than like a a hard question and hard shown using the two sequences we have, using two equations um, plus the corner formula. So the first is the defining sequence for S. And the second thing is you need to know something about um, this ideal sheet, but it's just, you, you can see from the way that um, the ideal sheet, the way Z was defined, it's defined like this. Um, we have the following sequence on x times p. So then you can you use these two equations. Um, um, so, so the first equation lets you turn cohomology of sims of s into cohomologies of these two bundles. And the second equation lets you understand cohomologies of this and this. And um, 
we're working relatively over x times p and we have the cohomology of almost all uh, line bundles on projective space vanishes and that comes into play so you use that plus kunf and then it's just a direct calculation okay so um so the point is that it, it turns um uh, this procedure will turn um, Green's conjecture instead of a question about um, some, some complicated questions about um, the geometry of Hilbert schemes. It's just some straightforward computations that really are just Kuna formula plus, plus these exact sequences. So just in, in maybe, I know I'm already over time by one minute. So just in one more minute, let me say one other thing. Um, so we took one wedge of this but um, if you take a different wedge, then you solve another conjecture which was open. So um, another consequence. So if instead of uh, wedge K plus one, we take wedge K of this, Then the exact same argument using Kuna formula plus these equations one plus two uh, shows us that we get the same calculation gives us um, an isomorphism like this H1 which K M I P prime star L to this. So uh, this is wedge K is the determinant of gamma, which we can compute twisted by uh, L. It shows you that this is an isomorphism, but uh, you can reinterpret that and then you can take the jewels um, and this thing, when you dualize, uh, this is some determinant, we can ca calculate it. And um, if you dualize this isomorphism, That, um, that you get by the same procedure, but just by taking a different wedge of this exact sequence, then you get an isomorphism from sin k minus two. Turns out the, the space on the right is dual to sin k minus two h naught of e, by an easy calculation. And the space on the left is dual to k k minus one x l, the last non-vanishing um, um, syzygy space on the top row. So this implies that all syzygies in um, the last non-zero syzygy space are constructed by this Einelazisfeld construction I referred to earlier um, associated to sections in H0E and from H0E and this conjecture was called the uh, geometric sensitive conjecture. Okay, so kind of, um, I guess the key idea is that instead of working on X, you work over uh, X times some parameter space, which parametrizes the relevant um, secret loci you're interested in. And, uh, and then over this much bigger space, you get vector bundles and it's just, um, it's just, it, it just turns out that that working with these vector bonds is much nicer and uh, taking different different wedge powers of the sequences you can solve kind of two conjectures together which is nice okay so sorry for going over time okay thank you uh, so thank you very much so are there questions so uh, I'd like one, one question. So I can say, where do you use the, the even genus? Where do I use even genus? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's a good question. So it's, it's up. Um, uh, 
here, this bundle here. What happens in, um, in odd genus is the relevant space here. So for, for even genus, this, um, this space here, W1K plus one, is zero dimensional. For odd genus, it turns out that the relevant, um, the space is one dimensional. And that means that the vector bundle E is not unique. Okay, okay. So then you have to work, you could try to do it, but the, the relevant vector bundles um, form a moduli space, which is actually another K free surface. They form a two, because this, this one dimensional means that the, the relevant, that's for Mukai bundles, form a two dimensional space. Two dimensional hypercales are K3. So you get another K3. And then there's, there's just, it doesn't you you instead of you have to work with varying vector bundles varying over k3 so instead of a projective space it would be some projective bundle over a k3 surface and then so a kind of a crucial thing is when you try to do the computations at some point you just get almost all the vanishings you need by the kuna formula because you're looking at um o of, of some some o to the n or something of some various n on pn if you replace that projective space with a more complicated projective bundle over K3. You don't, you can't say anything about the, the vanishing, obviously. So. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, another question is, uh, how can you make this, uh, this the conjecture or the statement is uh, about the general, general curves? So can you make a general more precise uh, in this approach? Um, I need, the the problem is um, um, uh, so, so you 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 need crucially somewhere that the Picard rank is one uh, because you don't so that um, uh, let, let me let me see. Yeah, so the, the problem is that uh, yeah, you, you need somewhere along this, you, you'll find uh, that um, you need, I didn't quite spell it out, but it was, so what I didn't have time to say, about, talk about <coughs> in the proof was why this thing is locally free. Um, but it turns out that for this to be locally free, you need to use that Z to P is flat. And this only happens automatically if the Picard number is one. Um, otherwise, there could be sections of um, the canonical bundle which vanish on a curve. That's, that's the main problem. So, so I need to have that this ZS is zero dimension always. And otherwise, if, if there are new line bundles, you could have that there exists line bundles such that E minus, uh, minus D has sections. And that would, that would prevent this gamma from being locally free. Um, some, some, like, it, it's just, yeah, if, if the, you, you, you want that the ideal shape is always, is always, so that you have this causal complex, I wrote down. Um, here, it's you want so this is a causal complex, and so this this whole diagram is kind of flat over P. You want you need uh, the, the, the zero log cut loci are all the same dimension, and that's and that's exactly what breaks down if the Picard number is not one. So more generally, you can uh, generalize it to some condition that um, says that you have no line bundle such that H naught E minus um, D <coughs> has a section, but then that doesn't give you a new theorem that's, that was still known in that, with that generality somehow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there more questions? So could you run similar argument for other surfaces like a billion surface? I am sure that one can, yes. I, I haven't had the chance to do it, but I am sure that there have, so, so there's a paper by Einar Lazarsfeld where they construct 
syzygies um, from, um, from various special loci. If you have a candidate where you know a way to construct a lot of syzygies and you conjecture, but that's all the way there are to construct syzygies, for example, that's, that's so normally the way people come up with these conjectures about um, syzygies is they construct a bunch of syzygies space, syzygies, use that to say, okay, a bunch of betting numbers are non-zero. And then they just conjecture, but is everything they can prove is non-zero is exactly the, uh, um, the, the elements which are non-zero. And they do that via this construction of ein Lazarsfeld, which actually generalizes all previous constructions. So if you have a, and there's lots of conjectures about various different varieties, if you look at the conjectures in the literature, you work out how to map that, how, to, how that conjecture is coming from an ein Lazarsfeld construction, then um, you can just try to do it. But the, the only new idea here, I think, the main new idea is just to do it over the whole relative parameter space, parametrizing all the sections and working with vector bundles on some much bigger space. Um, and yeah, there's lots of different conjectures for lots of different uh, geometric varieties. And um, it should be the case that one can prove, yeah, new conjectures using this. So, okay. for example, for abelian varieties, as an example, for which there are conjectures, um, <coughs> and maybe this maybe this can work. Thank you. So, so I'm kind of curious now. What can you expect for hyperelliptic curves? Say again. So, for hyperelliptic curves. curves. Yes, so, so what, what do we expect for, for CCG for hyperlytic curves? Oh, uh, we know everything there is to know about. You can write the resolution down. So, um, <coughs> I, I can't do it off the top of my head, but for hyperlytic curves, so, so, so actually, this is the, um, I should have said something. Um, there's a more general conjecture that works for any so if you can prove this you know the resol the resolution um, so corollary this um, a corollary of this by an argument of a proto and Farkash <coughs> is that we know exactly which Betty numbers um, BPQ are non zero. Actually, really, this is just a, a proto. A proto found a way that once you do it for a general curve, you know it for any general curve of arbitrary canality. So, not just hyperelliptic, but trilid and any, any canality. Um, so, we know exactly which things are non zero for a general, there's still a general assumption um, curve of any canality. But somehow um, the key thing is to do um, is to do it for a general curve, and then you get um, you, you get the answer. So actually, Green Green has a conjecture which says that uh, BP two <coughs> in, in complete generality is um, is zero if and only if. P is less than the Clifford index of the curve. But it turns out that the general case implies this for a general curve of any canality. So this will, this will tell you exactly which entries are, are non-zero. Okay. Oh, more questions? Um, so betting numbers are upper semi-continuous? Yes. Oh, so. um, <laughs> yes. It's, it's possible to prove this is there, using, is there the well, one way is using the definition I gave, uh, using these kernel bundles. <coughs> so at least, uh, so it, in our situation, it's, it looks, it's, it's, uh, it's something like this. And then you just have upper semi-continuity. You can write the betting numbers um, in terms of kernel bundles like this, and then and then use that. So, like in this case, um, it is just like this for this thing here. And then you have just just ordinary um, semi continuity. So, is there a, a ma maximum number? So, the worst is there a worst curve? 
So the worst is a hyperliptic. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but we don't know all the betting numbers in general. Um, so, sorry. So, so, so what we ha what we know is we know this. We know the betting numbers completely for canonical go. And then this implies certain vanishings um, for an arbitrary or for a general curve of any canality. But what we but we don't know the betting numbers for most curves. We actually only know half of them. So if you give me a, if you tell me uh, you give me a curve and you tell me it um, it has I don't know uh, various properties about this curve. Um, if it's not general, then no one can no one knows what the Betty table is. So they can, the numbers can get very big and they're not actually around the middle of the table, at least they're completely not understood. So what happens, let me just say, uh, cause it's related. What happens in, uh, you get these tables like this, where they have the property that there's only one non-zero entry on each diagonal. But if the curve is not general, that's not true. Um, then you start getting, as the curve gets less and less general, you get more and more entries down here, which are non-zero. And then you don't know um, any of the entries, you just know their difference. So they can be very big. And there's not much known for, for completely special curves. Thank you very much. Are there more questions? So if not, next time, the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.